Ruchim Abba'im, welcome everyone. Um, and we're going to just go one hour tonight. Um, we actually went moved from Wednesday to Tuesday because of the holiday. And then it turns out that I have the unexpected delight of having my grandson with me. So that's why we're only going to go for one hour. Um, because then I have to take him back to where he's sleeping overnight, but I'm so happy to have him here. And we're going to be together, God willing, for Thanksgiving. His parents are trying to get COVID tests before they come. He already had one, so we can be together. What a world we're living in. And I've talked to so many folks who aren't able to be with family. So for all of us, we're at least able to be together and um, the theme, of course, always is gratitude. So may we be grateful to be together. Welcome, Hector. Very glad to see you again tonight. And welcome, Stephen and Susan and Nikki and Muriel and Ned and Marilyn and Stephanie and Jeffrey. We're delighted to have you here tonight and Heshi and maybe David's going to join us. And Jill is the Road of Shalom person. Um, and that actually is her name. She's not just pretending to be Rabbi Maderer. Um, so um, <clears throat> we're going to take a look at Parashat Vayetze tonight. Um, we're in this really beautiful portion of the Torah that is with these great narrative stories. And I hope you'll enjoy the work that we're gonna do together tonight. So we're going to begin with our bracha. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen. So here, whoops, wrong one. Okay, that's not it. Stop share. Let's see if I can get the one that I want. Still not what I wanted. Okay. Um, I clicked on it and after Jill was so helpful, <laughs> um, blessing for Torah study, click share. Let's see if we get it this time. No, it's the wrong one. All right. I'm not sure what to do, Jill. I, I'm, I'm seeing it. So you might just not have that window up front for you. Ah, I see. Okay, got it. Here it is. I'm glad you guys can see it. Yeah. So this is our blessing for diving into the study of Torah. I'm glad that you could see it while I was seeing something else. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kichanu B'mitzvotav Vitzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. And do it, let's do it in English as well. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of the universe, who has sanctified us with commandments and commanded us to be engaged with words of Torah. So um, I'm now going to share a different screen with you to kind of let you know where we are. And let's see if I can get this one up. And then I can see it and you, yay. Okay, this is the one I wanted. I'm sorry it's so small, but um, you might be able to Make it a little bigger. Rabbi, if you use the magnifying icons in the top left corner there, you can uh -huh. zoom in. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I tried to do that when I, you know, I tried to highlight it. So spotlight search. No, so that's, the, that's not yeah. it. The, uh, in, the, in the window, in the, under the red, yellow. Oh, green. this. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. So here we are. We have Sarah. Is that working? No. It's just, you just have to click the magnifying glass a couple of times. Right now it's okay. just got you. Okay. Yeah. Ah, so okay, you have to I got it too big. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I want this to go away. How do I get that away? Click, click you... something else on the screen outside of the box. There ah, you go. okay. All right, so here we have, can you see my little yep. cross thing? Okay, great. All right, so here we have a genealogy. Um, to let us know where we are. So we started with Adam and Eve, and we started with their two sons who 
you remember? Maybe let's see who remembers. So who are they? Who are their two sons and what happens um, to them? Please, Heshi, unmute yourself. Cain and Abel. And what happens between the two of them? Um, he kills he them. Kills them. <laughs> yeah, okay, who kills yeah. whom and what's the issue? I'm pretty sure Cain kills Abel. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the issue? I'm uh, not quite sure other than I think he had anger issues. Yeah, he evidently did have anger issues. Anyone else want to raise their hand and remember the story from the early part of Genesis? It's about, it's about offerings to God and um, jealousy and the offerings not being accepted. And it ends in the first fratricide. It's the first family and this terrible, terrible result. So then there's this sense of starting over and we have the story of Noah and um, not, and some difficulties in that family as well when there was fear that it was the end of the world and there wouldn't be any opportunity to have any future. And then we have this story of Abraham. So here um, we've got getting a little bigger and bringing it down so you can, oops, that's not gonna work. Okay, uh, back to, you can see Abraham over here. And Abraham, if you remember in the stories that we've read so far, um, Abraham has two wives. He starts out with Sarah and she's infertile. And so she says, well, why don't you take my handmaiden, Hagar, and cohabit with her and maybe we'll be able to have a son through her. So this, is, the uh, connection is successful and Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. And then Abraham, if you remember, is visited by three strangers who say, not to worry, Sarah will conceive. And Sarah actually in her old age, she laughs because she says, what are you talking about? I'm beyond the time of giving birth. <clears throat> I'm beyond the time of women. And nevertheless, she gives birth to Isaac. So here we have these two sons of Abraham um, who are from separate wives. And then Isaac in last week's portion or the two weeks ago when we, we were together, met Rebecca and he, and it's after the birth, after the death of his mom. And we talked about the fact that Rebecca is clearly the, the right one for him, that Abraham asks his servant to go and find a wife for his son. And she's the one who comes forth at the well and waters the camels. And then when her family, um, when uh, the servant of Abraham says, will you come? The family says, it's up to her. And she says, yes, I will come. And she meets Isaac and they, and he, Isaac takes her into his mother's tent and they end up, she ends up having twins. And in last week's portion, which we didn't get to study together, the twins are fighting in her womb. And she's saying, if this is happening, if I'm having this issue physically um, in my body, who am I? God, why are you doing this to me? And God says, God speaks to her and says, the younger will serve, the older will serve the younger. So we've already seen, this is now the third, the reason I wanted you to see this chart is that this is the, th the third set of brothers where there's a problem between the brothers. The first brothers, it ends up with um, Cain killing his brother Abel. And then Cain's punishment is that he has to wander the earth for the end of his days. Then we see Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael also is sidelined to his younger brother, Isaac, who is, carries on the line of his father, Abraham. And then we've got two more brothers who are 
competing. And that's really um, the story that we had last week about how Jacob, so the brothers are Jacob and Esau and how Jacob cheats his brother Esau out of the father's blessing when Esau comes in famished from the hunt. He's a hunter. Jacob is the one who tends the fires um, and is the kind of stay at home guy. And I, and Esau is the macho um, brother. And he says, I'm famished. Just give me food. And he says, well, I'll give you the food if you sell me my the birthright that you're supposed to have because you're the firstborn. Isaac, and Esau says, whatever, feed me. I'm starving. I'll do it. I don't care. And then later on, when it's time for Isaac, the father, to give the blessing, Rebecca, who favors Jacob, pushes Jacob in to pretend to be Esau, and Isaac gives the blessing to Jacob. So where our story begins this week, Jacob is running away from his father. His father has now given him the blessing unwittingly, although there's some confusion. Did he really know it was Jacob? Um, it's a very, very rich story. So Jacob is running away from his brother's ire. And I just wanted you to see that there's this pattern here of these warring brothers. And what's very interesting is that these two brothers will be reconciled at the, birth, at the death of their father, just as Isaac and Ishmael are reconciled at the grave of their father. And then, of course, the next generation to come is Jacob has, has actually four women with whom he has children. And you see from this complicated diagram here, um, Jacob and Leah have Dina. Jacob and Rachel have Joseph and Benjamin. Jacob and Bilcha have Dan and Naphtali. And Jacob and Zilpah have God and Asher. And these guys are the tribes of Israel. Oh, I left out Jacob with Leah doesn't just have Dina. He also has six other sons. So these there's six here and then there's five here and Dina isn't counted, but um, these are the 12 tribes of Israel. So did we count right? Six and six, I miscounted. So, um, but that's, that's coming next. But what we have now where our portion this week is called Vayetze, and it really focuses on the story of, um, of Jacob as he's running away from his brother Esau. But this is the story that we will then enter into is the Jacob, is the Joseph cycle, which is also extremely rich. And this is our last time together in the four sessions that we planned, but I want you to keep tuned, um, keep tuning in um, to this amazing story, which we read every year because it is so, so rich. And I've read it a million times and I still find new stuff. So um, that's why I wanted to kind of give this as a little taste um, of where we're going. So my next screen share um, is for, let's see, let's see if I can do this. Um, family tree, is this it? No. Okay, it's down here, just one second. I'm gonna have to get it for you. Okay, uh, close. Okay, um, close. All right, here. I might need my friend Jill again. Share screen, let's okay. see. I opened, I opened what I wanted to show, but it didn't come up. So when you go to share your screen, the other option is if you're comfortable with just your entire screen being shared, you can just hit share, share. Everything. Oh, that's fine. Okay. And then, yeah. And so then just okay. go to the window that you want to show up and you'll probably need to expand it or zoom in on it. Okay, fine. Um, 
All right. Well, this one I'll do next, but the one I really want is, oh, where is it? Hmm. Hold on. It was, oh, uh, sorry. I thought I had it. Oh, I typed out the whole Torah portion for you guys today. I really want you to see it. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Where is it? Uh, if you can remember what you called it, you can do a search for it. Okay. Um, in that window. Okay, but it's a... Here it is. There it is. Okay, great. All right. Can you see it or not yet? We can see it. You might want to zoom in on that okay. top left corner. All right. So here we are, Vayetze. Um, we're just going to look at the beginning of the portion. Um, and I, what I tried to do, and here's why I need Jill in my life. Um, I, I tried to bold and make things bigger. And you see that I was successful. And then I was also unsuccessful here. I got part of it, but not all of it. All right. So as you all know, um, the uh, portions are named after one of the first words um, in the portion. And so um, you see that the first word here is Vayetze, which means, and Jacob went out. But I would love to have one of you um, read uh, this. Um, help me by being one of my readers. So um, because I can't see everyone at once, I'm just going to call on ones I can't see. Um, so just unmute yourself. And I'm going to ask Heshi to be our first reader. Um, and how about um, reading both verses 10 and 11? Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He came upon a certain place and stopped there for the night, for the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. Stop. Thank you. So what I've done here, I, I really wanted to point out, first of all, as I said, the name of the portion and then the word makom. So you might have heard this word before. It means place. But here it is repeated three times in this very second line of the portion even though it's verse 10, it's only the second line of this portion, according to the Masoretic text, the way we divide it up. And um, so, and the way it's translated is it's important for us to see, um, I, highlight, I highlighted it in both the Hebrew and the English, that he came upon this place and taking one of the stones of the place he put it under his head and lay down in that place. So here it's a place that doesn't have a name, interestingly enough. Yet the word makom is repeated three times. So that the rabbis really have fun with this, but I wanted you to be able to see it in both English and in Hebrew. And now this is a line that many of you have read many times. And um, I'm going to ask Stephanie, does that work for you to, to be our next reader? Um, and read verse 12, which isn't even marked with 12, and just read it in English, please. He had a dream, a stairwell was set on the ground, and its top reached to the sky, and angels of God were going up and down on it. Okay, so you kind of maybe remember this story from Sunday school or not, um, but here we have this He's come to a place which is no place and every place, but it doesn't even have a name. And he puts these stones under his head and has this pretty miraculous dream. Nikki, would you read 13? And the Lord was standing beside him and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The ground on which you are lying, I will sign to you and your offspring. Okay, and read one more verse too, please. 
Do you need to scroll this down? Okay, so I have to, thank you very much. Go for it. Your descendant shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Go on, because it's God speaking, we'll ha keep having it. Remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Okay, Jeffrey, would you continue with line 16? Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is present in this place and I did not know it. Shaken, he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the abode of God and that is the gateway to heaven. Should I continue? Muriel, would you continue please? With 18? Yes. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He named that site Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz or Luz. Okay. Um, and why don't you read um, 20 and 20, read all the way 21, 20, uh, 20, 21, 22, please. Jacob then made a vow saying, if God remains with me, if God protects me on this journey that I am making and gives me bread to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safe to my father's house, the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's abode and of all that you and of all that you give me I will set aside a tithe for you all right just one more verse um and then we're going to go back and talk about what we've read here um Marilyn can you just read verse one of chapter 29 um Jacob resumed his journey and came to the land of the Easterners. Okay, so for some of you, this is the very first time you've encountered this text. For some of you, this is like, I've read this one before. So I would love to hear from you, questions, stuff you never saw. I have a question. Please. Um, in 12, in 13, it says, I am the Lord, the Lord, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, but his father wasn't Abraham, his father was Isaac. Ah, okay. So it's, it's his grandfather, Abraham. Right. Yeah. And, but it says also your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Very interesting that you point that one out. Hmm. Okay, um, other thoughts? His vow is very conditional. I will be with God, but only if God is with me first. Mm. Okay, any other thoughts about um, that? I find it interesting that they keep calling it the place, but then at the end it has a name. It's Luz. Hmm. Yes. Yes. So why, why is that? Good. Good questions. Okay. Um, more. More. I was going to ask, why is it important that the name changes? Ah. So already in the Torah, we've seen the importance. We actually talked about name changes last time about people, but place names too in history. Um, many of, you know, we, we live, someone is gonna help me here. Um, 
did Philad I bet Philadelphia had a name before it was called Philadelphia, right? Certainly Pennsylvania did. I mean, it's Penn's Woods, right? Um, so place names definitely have evolved over time. Um, Constantinople became Istanbul. Um, and it's very interesting because I'm thinking right now we're living in a time where we're going to see a lot of name changes. Um, you know, just as all these Civil War heroes uh, are being exposed um, as being slave owners and the statues are going to come down, we're going to see, na see name changes as well. So here is also the whole idea. So what does Beth L mean? Does anyone know? Uh, yes, house of God. And that was going to be my uh, question because God appears in many different places. And yet this one place is named Beth L. And I never associated it with um, this portion. I guess I never read it that much. But when I think of Beth L today, I think of it as a popular synagogue name as well. Right. Uh, and L meaning a name for God. And there were so many places God appeared. Why is this place Bethel? Wonderful. And if um, some of you may remember in the story of the Akedah, in the, um, the almost sacrifice of, of Isaac, actually, um, on Har Moriah, um, some scholars, and I'll um, turn to that in a minute, say that actually that's where this is happening, you know, because it's not named. And it's named in the story of the almost sacrifice of Isaac as um, it's, Abraham gives it a name. I think it's Be'er El Roi or something like that. I should know it by heart. Um, but the idea of a place that God has seen then gets a different name. And so I love your question and the fact that, and clearly um, the tradition has wrestled with this. And if we think of, you know, for ourselves as um, place names and names of towns that don't exist anymore, um, we've certainly seen this. I mean, this is one of the, well, talking about Philadelphia and, you know, where we live, um, we've lost so much of the Lenape Indians who lived here, um, of the natives who, who owned and loved and um, farmed um, this land and what were their names for this place. And we have native names all over the country that have been lost. Um, so, hopefully we are at a time where we can dig through some of the layers of history and see, well, what was it called before? And what was life like before? And that's part of what at least draws me back to the Bible again and again, to see what is the, what, how have these stories, how have we kept these stories going and how, um, and how can they influence us today for good? How can they inform us um, as we try and live our lives um, on land that we have a lot of questions about and that nourishes us now, but who did it nourish before? And I mean, that also reminds me of the responsibility to, to conserve this beautiful land um, that we live on. So, you know, it's, this our story, the story of um, the ancient the ancient Israelite story that is our story is also very connected, not just to a specific plot of land, but the, to the idea of um, caring for the earth and that the earth nurtures that that we are dependent on the health of the earth. So what we call it, I mean. We, there is this real sense throughout the entire Torah, I think, that we are all just temporary residents here. And what does that mean? Even though we have the story of passing it on, this land will belong to you. Well, it'll belong to me only 
to pass it on to those who follow me. And so you see, I mean, there's all these layers even built into this, what would seem like an otherwise simple story. So I wanted to, but I wanna hear more from you. So I have um, to speak out because uh, I can't see you all at once, unfortunately. It makes me think about Lawrence Kushner who, who wrote about the Lord was in this place and I, I did not know it, talking about uh, an awareness that, that, that often we don't allow ourselves to be aware of divinity as we're walking along, as we're going to new places. And so to me, maybe the change of name and everything has to do with Jacob's awareness after the fact that God was in that place. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly where Larry Kushner gets this line. I mean, here we have in line 16, um, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is present in this place and I did not know it. And I, I apologize for my uh, inability to make the whole word bamakom here, but um, vayaketz Yaakov, um, Mishnato from his sleep, Vayomer, Achen, Yesh Adonai. See th these four words right here, these four letters. This is, um, you can see this, right? What I just did. Um, these four letters are God's name. Um, one of God's, the, one of the ways that we spell God's name in the Torah. Um, yesh Adonai, Bamakom Hazeh. And then here's the phrase that you are referring to, the Anochi lo yadati. The Anochi lo yadati. And I did not know. And it's um, sometimes uh, translated as, and I, I did not know it. And the reason they translate it that way sometimes is that the Anochi means I. And lo means no, and yadati means I didn't know it, you know, or I, I did know. So lo yadati means I didn't know, and I, I didn't know. So um, we're going to end tonight with um, learning a phrase, um, learning a, song, a tune that some of you may already know for the next line, um, vayar Vayomer ma nora hamakom hazeh. And he and vayar, and this is interesting that it's translated shaken here. And he, he saw or he realized, I mean, there's lots of translations. Some of you have books in your laps. You can share the translation that you've got. Um, and vay, um, vayar and he, said, ma nora hamakom hazeh. I put that here in transliteration so you would see it. How awesome or how um, the word for awe and the word for fear are the same in Hebrew. So it could be how fearful, but how awesome. And you can see how these two words come together in this beautiful way. Ma nora hamakom hazeh. And then he goes on, Ein ze ki'im beit Elohim. Isn't this, this is God's place. Ein ze ki'im beit Elohim. Veze sha'ar hashamayim. So some of you, as you just, as you said, beit El sounds like the name of a synagogue, Beth El. Shar HaShemaim. Any of you ever go to a shul or hear of a synagogue named Shar HaShemaim? Sure, or Shar HaShemaim? Sure. Here it is, right in the Torah. The gateway to heaven. So I have a question. Please. So isn't God everywhere? So isn't God's, isn't every place where God is. So he's here now. He's 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 with me, or she's with me, um, 
rather. Um, and, and so is this, is this to say that God's in this place and nowhere else? Uh, or, God, wonderful. or God was in this place for Jacob, like Jacob was in a, the right headspace that had this dream and he was like, oh, you know, this is where God lives. You know, similarly, I could, uh, you know, I could go sit down and, and, you know, just everything's great and, and God's with me. So that God's in this place as well. So he's everywhere. She's everywhere. I'm sorry. She's everywhere. So this is perfect, Hesh, that um, what this, what I think this text does is that it opens for us the possibility is, can't God be everywhere? Right. Um, that God is everywhere and I just didn't notice, that I just didn't realize it. And, you know, bringing in Rabbi Larry Kushner's wonderful teaching um, that God is in this place, which is all places. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things we haven't mentioned, I don't think I said, is hamakom is one of the words, one of the names for God. It's one of the reasons I wanted to lift this up, you know, is that makom means both space, but it also means the one who is in every space. Mm. Or God is in every space. Could we look at space more metaphysically? It's, and it's that not that Jacob is in a particular space of physical land, but that he has reached the space in his life where he's able to have this dream and see God. And the actual physical place is irrelevant. Beautiful. That's a great, that's a great reading, Nikki. Thank you. So here is a text, I think, for all of us, for the ages, that it's not just, I mean, what I'm hoping we do is to lift it up off the page, you know, out of the book and into our own lives. You can't make a space into a monument. So mm -hmm. when he takes the stone and says it's a pillar to the Lord, it has to be a thing. Okay, it can't just be empty space. So it's important, it feels to me, that he takes this, that he says God is in this thing, and I'm going to make that into a, a monument, an icon, a pillar. Well, and think of all of us, too. You know, how, I mean, I, I mentioned the whole idea of monuments that we're now tearing down, but the idea of wanting to erect a monument. Yes. You know, wanting to say, this happened here, or I want to remember that something happened. Yeah. And this will remind me. And it will remind others who passed. Yes. 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 I mean, and here it's, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I bet, and I would love others to um, join in here. Um, in my, in my pre-COVID life, um, I spent a lot of time on the train <laughs> um, because I had a part-time job in Washington working at our seminary. And so I was in 30th Street Station a lot. And some of you know, there's this amazing statue standing you know, in the entrance um, at 30th Street Station um, of an angel holding a fallen soldier. And it's a statue in commemoration of lives lost, I believe in World War I. And names are written on the pedestal. And so I've often said, I'll meet you at the angel. <laughs> um, you know, if I'm meeting a friend there. But the idea that that, that angel presides over that glorious space with the very, very high ceilings there, um, where none of us have been for a long time, <laughs> maybe. Um, and the idea of, you know, I mean, here we're in the world of angels um, when we're in the Torah, but 
but I love what you're saying, Marilyn, that it's a reminder to all of us, yeah. no? And it's a reminder of people who gave their lives and it's this kind of, and I don't even wanna say permanent because nothing is really permanent, but it's there for a long time, you know? And um, actually I'm sitting here with my eight-year-old grandson. And one of the things that he and I have done together is visit more than one statue of his favorite president, Abraham Lincoln. And the idea that we had such a man as the leader of our country. And there are probably more statues of Lincoln than any other American president scattered around the country. Um, and the reminder of honesty and courage and vision and and right now, you know, we've he's been his name has been um, evoked quite a bit in terms of trying to uh, heal um, a divided country because our country is so divided now. So, thanks for letting me have that um, discourses. So, I want to share something else with you um, that I pulled up. Let's see, share screen, how will I do this? Nikki was so, uh, I mean, uh, there, I had such help in getting up the, here it is. Okay. Um, all right, close and now. Can you see this Rashi or not? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, share screen. Uh, uh, all right, I've got to, how do I move it? So here, all right, share screen. Here we are. All right, so now you can see it. So I wanted to share just a couple of Rashi's um, thoughts. Um, and Rashi, many of you know, is the French commentator who, uh, has something to say about every word in the Torah um, and got many of his ideas from classical Midrashim. We looked at some classical Midrashim last time we were together. Um, and that very first line where it says, Jacob left um, Beersheba, he writes about it and says, the departure of a righteous person from their city makes an impression as long as a righteous person is in their city, that person is in its glory and splendor and beauty. When that person leaves, there depart also some of that city's glory, splendor, and beauty. So I thought that was a kind of interesting thing for us to think about when um, in a time when so many of us have moved and people that we know have moved and how we feel when a friend leaves um, and moves to another place or God forbid when someone passes away and a whole community feels bereft. And so here, you know, Rashi is picking up on that. Um, you can't see the previous lines as at the exact same time, but when they originally um, when it, it talks about the first Hamakom, the place, Rashi says it's the place of the Amidah. So it might not be named, but it's exactly um, where, excuse me, the Akedah happened, where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. And then there was another line that we didn't really look at, um, but I will read it again. It's in, the, it's, um, in line 12 that Jacob had a dream, a stairway, oh no, before that. Um, he came upon a certain place and stopped there for the night for the sun had set. Rashi says, the sun set unexpectedly, suddenly, not at its proper time, just in order that Jacob would stay overnight. So the, the whole idea that God is setting up this opportunity for Jacob to have this dream. And then at the very end, um, in the, the, we read the first line of the next, of the next chapter. Um, and it was, Jacob resumed his journey and came to the land of the Easterners. And then it was 
And I wrote underneath that, literally, Jacob lifted up his feet. As soon as Jacob received the good tidings, writes Rashi, that he was assured of God's protection, his heart lifted up his feet and he walked swiftly. So I just thought, I really like that image that when our hearts, when we've received good news, it's, we walk in a different way. It's almost like our heart lifts up our feet. So anyway, I, I just thought it was fun to share those, those tidbits with you. And um, I also didn't want to neglect, I mean, one of the things that um, Hesh and I have talked about a little bit is what makes this a queer reading? Um, and that was partly why I wanted to put up the genealogy in the beginning. And we talked about it a little bit last time um, when we talked about the love story between Isaac and Rebecca. And that of course, this seems like a very um, heteronormative story where you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. Is everybody, you know, are men only going to couple with women and um, vice versa? And now I want to reassure us um, that we are reading these stories also of love and affection and finding what attracts us to each other, um, how Isaac, um, Isaac and Rebecca make a connection because of her kindness, how uh, Rachel, um, well, we'll come to Rachel later, but um, how here we've also got this, um, the competition between brothers, which is actually a story of, um, of what, is, what is real masculinity, how should men behave? And I want to mention that in the book Tor Queries, which I think some of you have and have read, um, my beloved colleague Yoel Khan has a wonderful essay on this portion about how this is really a coming out portion. Um, and the very first word, Vayetze, is about um, Jacob um, coming out of of his own entrapment in what masculinity was. And that's why he has to leave his home and he can't go home again until he finds himself. So um, very much reading it through, I don't wanna just say gay eyes, but the whole idea of what does it mean to really find ourselves? And that's of course the story I think in all of the Torah of what does it mean to find our own path, to find our own voice, to find um, our own relationship with other people and hopefully with God, um, because then we can be our full selves in the world, whoever we are meant to be. And sometimes that takes a very long time in our lives. Um, and for each of us, that journey continues. So I've done a lot more talking tonight than you have. And I really love hearing all of your um, insights and your sharing. Um, and maybe I will also say that Heshi and Ellen and I have been talking about where do we go from here? We've had four sessions together and it's been quite rich and wonderful. And um, we're talking about how to see each other again, and we don't know yet, but um, hopefully we can. So um, I really would love to end with the song um, and I'll put the words up in a minute, but I would love to hear some words from all of you as we're in this odd week where some of us thought we'd be traveling and there are a lot of people traveling and maybe some of us and those of us who aren't, hopefully we're gonna be on Zoom or telephone or something with people we love. Um, and it's fine to overeat if you're alone.
Any, anyone who wants to share something right now? This uh, stay at home order has taken new meaning for me because I actually was sent back to work in my office five and a half months ago and it was very safe because it was only four of us. Um, and I thought the hardest part was actually the commute because I didn't want to take SEPTA into Center City. Um, but as of Monday, I'm working at home. So I'm, I'm feeling more like everybody else now hmm. because I was getting out before. So it's just setting in for me. Ah, wow. Wow. Would others like to share something about this bizarre time we've been living in? My lovely friend, Rochelle, I haven't been able to see your face except on the photo, but um, I know you're here and that's been great. Oh, good, there you are. Hi, yeah, I am here. Hi. So. So I just wanted to share, I had conferences tonight and uh, just how challenging this whole thing has been, not only for students and teachers, but also for parents and just hearing all their concerns and their, how much they're worrying about their children lacking social interactions. And it just was really, really made me stop and think a little bit more about I mean, it's so isolating for us as adults, but you think of someone who's 14 or 15 and their whole world is about friends and suddenly they can't be with anybody and how difficult that is for them. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been really, really hard. Uh, and on parents of young kids who have been trapped at home with daycare starting, Rochelle, you're one of them, huh? <laughs> yeah, I have a... A one and a two year old, almost three. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, oh. um, and, and uh, we, you know, it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Um, we started a, um, a house project back in February. So we were staying with our, in, with my in laws um, temporarily. And then COVID happened. And then we had some contractor issues. So, um, so we've actually been living with my in laws. Um, for what nine ten months um uh so at, at least we have some extra people that we're quarantined with but also you know raising children with uh um an extra set of parents around uh and a small space with nowhere to go is um comes with its own challenges so uh, yes yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow and not having a home to go to yeah. Oh. But having a home and having family. So that's, uh, it, you know, something to be grateful for, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look at this text. Um, and I'm going to share Shefa Gold's tune with you. Um, let's see. Am I going to get it? All right. Oops, that's the Rashi. Let's see if I can get the other one. Uh, uh, okay. Um, all right, here it is. And now let's see if we can share this. Okay, can you see something now or not? No, okay. Um, I'm gonna try it once more. There we go. All right, so it's right in the middle. Um, can you see it? Yes, Manora Hamakom Hazek. All no, right. Still seeing the Torah, the Torah portion. It is. Okay. Okay, um, line 16, yes. Okay, so I just made it blue and that's what we're gonna sing. So this is, um, if you know, please join me and we can be totally cacophonous or you can sing by yourself. Um, just without 
unmuting. I'm fine with you unmuting. So this is how it goes. <clears throat> Manora hamakom hase Manora hamakom hase It's pretty much that simple so and it's a really I think beautiful thought. How awesome is this place? And I didn't even know it. Manora hamakom haze. Manora hamakom haze. Manora. So I hope that all of us can find something about the place that we find ourselves, wherever that is. It might be a corner of the space that we share with others. It might be a stone that we imagine that we hold in our hands and see that there is more there than we thought. How awesome is this moment? How awesome is this place? Even with all the difficulties that are swirling around us, even with all the uncertainties, how awesome is this space that we've been blessed to create with each other for the 10 of us, the 14 of us to be able to gather here tonight and to enter into a 5,000 year old story that still has resonance for us. So I look forward to more opportunities to study with you um, on Zoom and someday soon in person. That will be wonderful. But may all of you be connected by telephone, by Zoom, or in person with someone you love in the days to come. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Super. Rabbi. Are you still Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Are you still singing with Anna Crucius? I am. We're not able to meet in person, but we meet every week on Zoom. Okay. Yeah, so it's a real blessing. But you see, my voice could use more time in the choir. And I really look forward to being with my wonderful siblings or whatever we call each other in anacrusis so it's been Very quite a choir it's a great choir and when we start singing again may you all be invited you're welcome to go on our website anacrusis.org um, and see what we've been up to we've got a lot of videos um, of our performances so thank you all great thank, thank you. you for thank doing you. this Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, Ellen and Heshi, for setting up. Yes. Have fun with your grandson. Have fun with your grandson. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Bye. Bye. And I'll see some of you Friday. Okay. We hope. Yes. God willing. That's right. Good to see Bye. you, Rochelle. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night, all. Everybody. Bye bye.